Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. It's been a challenging week, as we all know, as we anticipated the verdict from George Floyd and the killing of Micaiah Bryan in Ohio, as well as the funeral on yesterday for Deontay. So what a blessing it is to come and be with one another on this Friday. Welcome to our afternoon session of the Mobile Institute of Ohio. I am the Reverend Dr. Geraldine Uhlenberg, filling in for Dr. Teresa Smallwood, who cannot be with us today, but sends her greetings and appreciation for your presence. On behalf of the Vanderbilt Divinity School, where Reverend Dr. Emily Towns is the Dean, and the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative, where Dr. Dean is the Director, and Reverend Dr. Teresa Smallwood is the Associate Director. If you are joining us for the first time this afternoon or the first time today, we had an excellent panel this morning discussing, discussing issues of race and gender. This afternoon, our second panel will discuss economics and politics. And tomorrow morning, we will have a talk back session giving all of you as well as our panelists an opportunity to engage. Let me now take the opportunity to introduce our moderator for the second panel, Reverend Gerald Cooper. Pastor Gerald Cooper is dedicated to the ministry of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and developing Christian disciples through sound biblical teaching and Holy Spirit inspired preaching. He serves as the pastor of Wayman Chapel, African Methodist Episcopal Church in Dayton, Ohio. Before going to Dayton in 2013, Pastor Cooper served as the pastor of St. James African Methodist Episcopal Church in Cleveland and a variety of other AME churches throughout the state of Ohio, as well as in Erie, Pennsylvania. Reverend Cooper is a native of Cleveland, Ohio. He earned his BA degree from the College of Worcester in Worcester, Ohio, where he majored in economics. He also earned the Juris Doctor degree from Capital University Law School in Columbus, Ohio, where he graduated with honors. While he is committed to trending, excuse me, while he is committed to tending to spiritual needs for the congregation for which he is blessed to serve, he also has had the opportunity to preach and teach in various parts of the country. Reverend Cooper has taken an active role in the empowerment of communities in which he has pastored through his service in various civic and community organizations. As an attorney, Pastor Cooper is a solo practitioner, focusing primarily in the area of nonprofit corporation law and contract negotiation. He has done dynamic work and is excited to be with us today. Reverend Cooper is married to Reverend Dr. Myla Cooper. They have two beautiful children and one grandchild named Grace. Please welcome me now in greeting Reverend Gerald Cooper. Thank you, Dr. Uhlenberg. Um, and thank you to Vanderbilt University Divinity School and the Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative for sponsoring uh, this um, institute. We also um, thank the director, Dr. Emily Towns, and a special thanks to Associate Director, uh, the Reverend Dr. Teresa Smallwood Esquire. Um, it has been a joy working with her. Our focus this afternoon is the economics and politics of racial justice. And we have an awesome panel assembled today, and I'm excited uh, to introduce them now and look forward to their insights and wisdom. We have Dr. Jay Bula, who is an assistant professor of history and ethics and Black Church and Afri African Diaspora Studies at Methodist Theological School in Ohio. 
where she teaches in church history and African-American religious and ethical studies. Her teaching and research interests are in African-American religious intellectuals, gender and sexuality in US history, African-American music and social movements and race ethnic studies. She is currently at work on a monograph titled Soul Salvation, Social Liberation, Race and Evangelical Christianity in the Black Power Era, 1968 to 1979. She earned her Bachelor of Arts degree from Xavier University, a Master of Arts from The Ohio State University, and the Master of Theological Studies from Methodist Theological School in Ohio, and her PhD from Drew Theological School. We also have Reverend Dr. Myla P. Cooper, who is an ordained elder in the AME Church and part of the pastoral team at Wayman Chapel AME Church in Dayton, Ohio. She serves as Vice President for Student Affairs and Dean of Students at Antioch College, where she is also an adjunct, adjunct faculty member and previously served as the director of the Coretta Scott King Center and as Vice President for, for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. She is the founder of For the Kingdom Ministries. She earned her BS in Communication Studies um, from Indiana University of Pennsylvania, as well as her Master of Arts in Higher Education Administration. Uh, she earned her Master of Divinity degree and Doctor of Ministry degrees from Payne Theological Seminary. She is a level three trainer in Kenyan nonviolent conflict resolution and a native of Philadelphia. She's a wife, mother of two, and grandmother of one, an activist, an advocate, and community focused. Mr. Randall McShepherd is the Vice President of Public Affairs and Chief Talent Officer for RPM International, Inc., a $6 billion chemical coatings and paint company headquartered in Medina, Ohio. In this post, he is responsible for managing external and governmental affairs, leading the corporate philanthropy program, facilitating corporate purchasing initiatives, and coordinating executive leadership development activities. An active community and corporate leader, Mr. Mr. McShepard, is currently serving on several boards in Northeast Ohio, including Baldwin Wallace University, Destination Cleveland, and the Cleveland Foundation. He is co-founder and chairman of Policy Bridge, which is a public policy think tank serving the Northeast Ohio region. He is currently serving as a member of Cuyahoga County, Cuyahoga County's Citizens Advisory Council on Equity. And he is also the co-founder of the Rid All Green Partnership, an urban farm located in Cleveland's lower Kinsman neighborhood. Randell was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and earned the Bachelor of Arts degree from Baldwin Wallace and the Master of Science degree from Cleveland State University. And finally, Dr. Zachary Williams is a native of, of Greenwood, South Carolina. Dr. Williams is the African-American Policy Director for the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition. He was formerly the Associate Professor of History at the University of Akron. He is the Director of the Africana Cultures and Policy Studies Institute, which is a nonpartisan scholar activist public policy think tank that uses African American history to understand and solve major policy issues and social problems. He founded the Black Male Summit and received its highest honor, the Legacy Award, in 2017. These are your panelists for this afternoon. We welcome them and we thank. Um, thank them for their time and look forward to what they have to say to us today. Uh, the theme for this institute is We Can't Breathe, Racism as a Spiritual, Moral, and Public Health Crisis. Um, the first thought I want us to, to deal with this afternoon um, and present to the panel, uh, some, some would say we, we've elected a Black president we currently have a black vice president. Many people assert that systemic racism does not exist. And that in fact, we live in a post racial society. So the question is, is there really a crisis? 
um, what is the current state of Black America economically and, and politically? Panelists, and, and just so you know, whoever wants to jump in first, jump in, and um, I will pose several questions and, and you just uh, move as the spirit moves you. All right. So, I'll so jump what is right the in. Is there a crisis? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'll jump right in. I mean, we applaud the country for electing um, President Barack Obama and now Vice President Kamala Harris. Um, but some are thinking this is the litmus test of a post-racial society. But if you if you take a closer look, uh, if you take a deeper look, um, that is not the case. Um, we are experiencing a um, pandemic of epic proportions, and I'm not talking about COVID. It's a calamitous um, situation. And I know um, some may have think that we have arrived because of the two examples that you gave, or if you look at the status of our middle class and upper middle class numbers, you know, living in the suburbs, 2.5 kids and adult, but people are still suffering economically. And there are some stats and some numbers um, with that. And politically, even politically, the red states are redder. Um, I'm interested in getting back to the state of Ohio. Um, you gave national examples, but if we talk about um, where we are politically in the state of Ohio, especially when you step south of Cleveland. Um, that hub tends to be uh, politically empowering for um, Black Americans in some ways, although my colleagues up in Cleveland um, may have, say, have something to say um, about that. We just passed the Stand Your Ground Law um, in Ohio. And so if we, if we step down from the political, from the national scene and look at um, our states, um, specifically the Buckeye State, if we look at some of our cities. And um, even if you look at the national level, um, President Obama, we were just talking about this one Ohio, but only a, about about 4.5%. And then Trump blew it out of the water twice in 2016 and um, 2020. And so if we look at all of the factors, every quality of life factor, health, economics, um, political, um, housing, um, we are represented disproportionately in a negative sense. And I'm happy to say more, but I want to hear what some of the other panelists have to say. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Cooper. Um, I uh, was joking earlier in saying that we are basically past the uh, chucks and pearls uh, phase of uh, economics and thinking about, you know, what it means to have representation. Um, I'm going to go back to the national level and then work my way back to Ohio, thinking about that right now there are over 140 million people living in poverty in the country, and the majority of those people are, um, are Black people. Um, I think that, um, <clears throat> and I don't want to just start, start with criticism. Um, cause I could say things like, well, you know, um, when I look at the political landscape, um, representation is good, but what really excites me right now, where we are as black people, that there's so many people in grassroots organizations. There's so many people working in the poor people's campaign and in other, uh, organizations that are doing really good work. I mean, um, when I think about just this week alone, politically, uh, the people convicted Derek Chauvin, for example, and a lot of that has to do with just work that's happening on the ground. So I think that while, yeah, we could say a lot about, you know, what's happening nationally on the lo on local levels, uh, there are a lot of Black activists who are doing some really good work. And so I think we're, um, we're at a turning point where we're seeing uh, just there's a lot of hope in, in, in young Black activists and the work that they're doing. Well, I, I, I agree with both comments, Dr. Bueller, Dr. Cooper. Uh, I would just say uh, that I would agree that we are in crisis. Um, and being a person who works in corporate America, I would have to talk about the uh, injustices that I see on a daily basis when I juxtapose uh, what I see in the corporate boardroom versus what I see in the, the hood that I grew up in, right? Um, uh, Brookings Institute um, last year released a, a study that said that 
uh, white uh, wealth is 10 times that of African-American wealth, um, that uh, the typical American family, uh, white family is about $171,000 in uh, revenue or, or wealth compared to 17,000. Uh, uh, that was a 2016 study. Um, one even more troubling, if not shocking, was the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston uh, did a study that basically showed that the median net wealth of white households in Boston was $247,000, brace yourself, versus that same uh, question posed for black families, $8. $247,000 median uh, wealth for white families in the Boston area compared to $8 for African-Americans. So that tells you all you need to know. Uh, the American dream is supposed to be about opportunities, resources. Everyone wants a nice place to live. Everyone needs transportation. Everyone wants to feed their families, uh, you know, and, and do all the, the, the things that some consider normal. But uh, African Americans are too many times and too many instances locked out of those opportunities, and it plays out in uh, you know the wealth gap and many other gaps. Um, uh, many statistics, many categories that we could talk about, from criminal justice to uh, education and education systems to uh, the way lending institutions help or hurt uh, minority businesses. To uh, I can go on and on, but um, that certainly uh, troubles me. The, the wealth gap component of it because um, I think that just hurts us and holds us back. And oh, by the way, I hail from Cleveland, Ohio, which is number one in poverty in this country, uh, both childhood poverty and adult poverty. So I see it up close and wrestle with it every day. Dr. Williams, did you want to chime in on this? I would just say that uh, racism has been declared a public health crisis, and that's another element that has to be added to the conversation. And so uh, that should be factored in. All right. Well, there appears to be a consensus that there is a crisis. Um, how, did, how did we get here? And why are we still here? Any takers? How did we get to the state of crisis? Yeah. Uh, man, <laughs> hmm. I think that uh, one thing that we have not properly done is given the problem of race back to white people. Uh, white people created race um, in order to organize this society. And I think that we, we keep saying that we have a race problem or we have a racism problem when will you have a white supremacy problem? So I think it's a matter of language and how do we redefine terms and put the responsibility back on white people to fix it? Like, you know, I'm looking at our panel even now and there's only people of color, black people and people of color here. Um, I'm not sure who's all watching on YouTube or on, on Facebook, but this, you know, the problems that we have stem from the people who created it. And I think that we, that's a, a, a conversation that I have in my history courses all the time um, with my students. They're always saying, well, you know, well, who are the leaders now? You know, what do we do with this information that you're giving us? And it's like, you, you gotta go to your Thanksgiving tables and start thinking about how you talk to uh, your families uh, or how you talk to your congregations about societal problems. Like we, we just haven't found um, uh, the, the word that's swirling around is that we haven't found the courage to not only, I mean, we have hard conversations, but to take some really concrete actions on how we get people to understand that um, the reason why we have these problems, I think uh, the, the closing lines that came out of, um, out of uh, Minneapolis this week about, you know, not a matter of George Floyd's heart being too big, but you know that the officer's heart was too small. And so it's like, well, how do we, um, particularly those of us who are theologically informed thinkers, how do we increase people, particularly our, our white friends, our white 
uh, family members, the people that we have in, in community um, to enlarge their hearts to think about how do they benefit from this system? How do they benefit and, and how can they, you know, have the, do these, uh, have these hard conversations, do these hard concrete actions to undo it? Now, I know that sounds kind of idealistic and, you know, there's, hope we have time to, you know, maybe think about how to do that. But until we get more white people involved in conversations around, you know, environmental injustices, uh, you know, health crisis, education, mass, incar mass incarceration, if, if Black people are the only ones who are having these conversations, we're going to keep kind of spinning around in circles. So I'll, I'll be quiet. I'd like to, um, not really a direct response, but I guess co-sign on what you're saying, Dr. Bula. Um, I wholeheartedly agree, but there, there's been an evolution and there's even a reason, a reason for that. Um, to answer your initial question, um, Pastor Cooper, um, it's systemic. And so, you know, this, this is hundreds and hundreds of years um, in the making and in the keeping. And uh, what Dr. Bueller was saying that resonates with me um, as an educator, um, and specifically on my current campus, um, there's a small group of uh, white colleagues, sometimes students, but generally colleagues who are actually doing the work and they are trying to do the work and they own white supremacy um, as a problem that they've created and they need to solve in partnership with, uh, with people of color, of course. But if you look at the evolution of the various diversity positions, whether um, Randall, they are in corporate America, lots of diversity, equity, positions in corporate America and education. And a lot of these positions evolved in the fight for equality and justice. And typically you find people of color in those jobs and some of those positions um, have um, made it possible for some upward mobility, you know, in terms of economics. And some of us, let's just be honest, get offended if there's someone who's in those positions who aren't uh, people of color. And so I think we need to widen the scope. And, and even when we're thinking about that in terms of who's leading, you know, who's leading those efforts. Um, also, I think that there's a backlash um, with some of the work that um, was done, you know, 20, maybe 30 years ago. I think part of that is 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 what we see in the Trump movement, not all of it, but part of it. There's a backlash that we elected um, President Obama. I'm waiting for the, you know, the backlash uh, for Vice President uh, Harris. But in the education realm, I see this backlash. People are tired of talking about racism. People don't want to hear about slavery, which is part of the root of our systemic issues. And so they don't want to hear it. And they feel that black people are getting too much attention. And it's easy for them to dismiss the disparities and the crisis that we're in um, because they are weary um, of hearing about it. And so I, I do think there's a backlash and I do think there needs to be um, a recreation um, similar to what um, Dr. Bueller is saying in terms of who's at the table um, with, with the solutions that we need. And I would just add to that, <clears throat> that um, you know, I'm, I'm a co-founder of a think tank uh, that's been around for 17 years called Policy Bridge. And, uh, you know, we came to the realization fairly quickly that um, changing hearts and minds um, can take a long time. And um, I think uh, Dr. Cooper hit the nail on the head. You know, many folks out there are very tired of having these conversations. They're uncomfortable. They feel like if they've gone to their one uh, bias training or diversity training, they kind of check that off and they want to move on and they don't want to talk about it again. They don't understand our walk and our uh, wrestling on a daily basis uh, with what might happen to a family member or what might happen to us. We're constantly reminded every, every day you turn on the news, we see this, these terrible things happening. So um, our approach at the think tank was to say, well, if we can't get their heart to care enough, let's talk about the pocketbook. So uh, we started really trying to point to the economic impact of uh, African-American and you know, black and brown people uh, in, in, in total uh, being held back. There is a significant tax burden on this country if uh, we continue to have to provide safety nets for those populations. There's a significant cost uh, that this country incurs when you're uh, you know, jailing uh, over 2 million people uh, on a, uh, an ongoing basis. Um, 
you know, health inequities, um, you know, again, that, that federal resources have to come in and uh, incur the costs for so many uh, sick people of color. So uh, it's in all of our best interest, black, white, brown, and, and anyone else to say, you know, if you have a problem with the safety net or the, the types of legislation that uh, those that would be considered uh, on the left in political terms are uh, pitching, then, uh, you know, the next best thing would be to sort of meet in the middle around what can be done to offset or to mitigate these uh, significant challenges that are in fact dragging us all down. Uh, we used to always say, uh, this is not a moral lament, it's an economic imperative, you know. Uh, we all are impacted. So um, I do want to just say one other thing um, for the sake of discussion with my fellow panelists. Um, the uh, county executive here in Cuyahoga County where Cleveland is located uh, said something very profound many years ago. Uh, he's a former speaker of the house in Ohio. And he said when he went and took that position that he always thought, uh, even before that in his political career, he always thought that um, the battle was between Republicans and Democrats. But he said once he became the Speaker of the House, he quickly learned that the battle, the true battle, is between rural and urban. And I think that's an important thing to reflect on because when you look at what happened in Georgia with the, the changes in the voting rights, and then you look at what's happening in all these other states across the country, keep in mind that you have multiple counties in most states. People of color are concentrated in the central cities. But the rest of those states are predominantly white and predominantly, uh, you know, uh, Republican or, or red leaning. Uh, so what is happening is in all of these various state legislators, uh, they have the votes to really control state policy. And uh, just to bring it back home with Ohio, right now we're uh, re redistricting, which we know is a big issue. And the five uh, individuals that are uh, taking the first swing at the, or a bite at the apple with uh, figuring out what our redistricting would look like are the governor, the secretary of state, the attorney general, the president of the Senate and the speaker of the house who all happen to be white and Republican. So think about the fact that if they don't get that right, it continues to perpetuate the problems that we've all been wrestling with and you really can't do a whole lot to improve the plight of black and brown people. So that's just an issue we have to figure out. We have to crack that code and uh, get more people of color in some of these uh, critical statewide positions. And I'll, I'll just add in terms of public health uh, standpoint that um, the CDC has reiterated pretty much what a lot of mayors in various cities have said, that racism is a public health crisis. Of course, that wasn't news to many people in African-American urban communities, but as long as we're you know, talking to the choir and we know all these facts, we don't control enough power to make change at the seismic level that we need. Um, but fortunately, there's been a ripple effect throughout the country and throughout the world, um, but it oftentimes takes sacrifice, loss of life, and complete devastation for us to move the needle just five yards ahead. And uh, I don't know how many of us are going to be around if that continues to be the toll or the price of the ticket, as James Baldwin suggested. And I think we're kind of cynical as a society as well. Um, our politics are driven, we say, by moral uh, means, but usually it's some sort of uh, uh, tribal instinct uh, that is uh, instinctive and that is uh, visceral. It's deep, but it's also surface at the same time. And so, you know, like for instance, with the uh, George Floyd Policing Act, with the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act, um, why is it that it takes so much just to get that passed through the U.S. Senate? Uh, even with the history of the U.S. Senate and the racist nature of the filibuster, and everyone knows about that, but knowledge is not enough to make change. Um, you know, it's like trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. I mean, we still try to do that, but we still can't pay the rent. Um, and so it's, it's hard for us because in many ways we're frustrated, we're fatigued, and we're traumatized, and we... Uh, can't oftentimes, I haven't been able to take that to the places we need to. And so we have then taken that and inflicted that upon one another. 
in various means in terms of, that's why I think the public health framework is so critical as we look at how do we characterize this and hopefully how do we prick, as King said, the conscience of America, but more so, even if we prick it, is it going to do the work that it needs to, done to, to, needs to do to be able to make things move at the, the deep level that we need as a society? And we, we've had protests upon protests upon protests, and those protests, many people have, have experienced fatigue at those by witnessing those and participating with those. And there are a lot of political leaders and, and people at various levels of society that are still not moved. And so I'll just end by saying, that I am heartened that the uh, Anti-Asian Hate uh, Crimes Act was passed at, at a vote of 94 to one. And so I don't see any way in the world why the John R. Lewis Voting Rights Act and the and maybe Josh Harley's vote was a mere protest vote, uh, because why would he oppose that? You know, um, Rand standing maybe, but politics is not the place for that. It's supposed to be public service. I mean instead of the other thing. But, but those two acts have to happen. And you know we have shooting upon, shooting upon, shooting. Families are sick and tired of being sick and tired. And people see it and know it, but do they see us and do they feel us? Uh, I'm hoping that after all this is done and this administration is doing an amazing job, um, and I'm heartened that this could be the, the most transformative presidency and vice presidency in American history, not because people are putting attention on themselves, but because they are rising to the occasion and meeting the needs of the people. And the people are participating at 100% of the level in a democracy. And that's what a democracy is supposed to be. We have a republic, but that's based on representation. Even though DC has had represent taxation without representation, hopefully that's going to change. But we, you know, we have to be continuing to be vigilant. And so I'm honored to be on the panel here and, and just hopeful and, and also with some righteous indignation that we have to keep the pressure on. So I'll, I'll leave that there. Just, just real quick, um, a couple of people have, have mentioned that the, um, and part of our focus is racism as a public health crisis. Why is it important to, to see racism as a public health crisis and, and how might that help us in our fight against racism. I'll just say something quick and then, you know, move out the way. But uh, that's that's the lens where we have to look at it through. And a framework is so important uh, to look at it. R uh, pub racism as a public health crisis, but through a human rights lens, let me add that. Because we too sing America, as Langston Hughes was saying, we too are human. And what it means to be human is to feel the full gamut of emotions. We have been told time and time again in spoken and unspoken, subtle, overt ways that we don't exist, we don't matter, and we don't have the right to express uh, rightful human emotion and expression at that. And so when you look at what's happened to uh, various members of, uh, of, of the community in relationship to police brutality, uh, redlining, you pick the issue as, as Brother uh, McShepard said and, and Dr. Uh, Mueller said and Dr. Cooper said, uh, there are so many issues out there and, and, and they're interconnected, intersected. But at the end of the day, it talks about not just the health of us as, as people, as a community, but the health of the nation, the soul of the nation coupled with the health of the nation. And, and right now, I'm, as, as one of my mentors, uh, Dr. Ron Daniels from um, uh, Youngstown, Ohio says, we are in a state of emergency, but the nation is in a state of emergency. We are in triage. Um, and people of um, uh, New Orleans know that, what that's like, but I, I hope that people at all levels of society, government, they've begun in business to make moves, but I hope they approach it as that, because if one of us are affected, one community, then all of us are. And it's like a cancer, as Dr. King and others have said, Reverend Dr. Bernice, that is eating away at American society and the world. The world is watching. If we don't deal with it, it will continue to spread. And we're at a level to we cannot ignore it. And so I think that's why racism is a public health um, crisis is the proper lens because everything then subsumes into that when we talk about the social determinants of health. Yeah, I like how you um, uh, articulated that Dr. Williams um, using um, this as a framework or a lens um, 
New strategies are always necessary in this fight. But if you look at it from purely a public health issue, we're sicker, we're dying at higher rates. If you zoom in on this last year of COVID, um, we are disproportionately impacted um, in part because of you know pre-existing uh, health conditions, but that's a part of it, right? And so we are impacted um, disproportionately in terms of contracting the virus, um, dying from the virus, um, and then if you want to move into um, the distrust that some of uh, some folks in our community have with the health system, there are reasons for that. And so folks didn't want to get tested. Um, definitely in terms of the vaccine, you know, if you look at that. And so if we look at it from a, a, just a, pup, a health and wellness, um, mental health, if you look at every factor, every quality of life, um, birth defects and um, uh, uh, birth, uh, you know, uh, women losing their um, uh, uh, children um, uh, while giving birth, you know, all of the different factors. We are di we 13 percent of the population and we are disproportionately impacted in all of these areas. And so we, just from a health and we can expand what we mean by health and wellness, certainly when we use this as a framework. But if we if we're only looking at our physical health, um, it's a public health crisis. Uh, my appreciation to both Dr. Williams and Dr. Cooper for setting it up like that, because again, um, when I first started speaking, I was thinking about language and I'm thinking, well, why, why frame it? Why frame racism as a public health crisis now when, when, we, when we've always had <laughs> racism? And I just think that, you know, I think that what, um, what COVID has done <laughs> is, is just help to expose, you know, all of these other issues that you all have named. But it's like, it's always been this way. And I think, you know, as we, um, I'm always in uh, conversations about what it means to return to school or to other institutions. And I think that what we've seen is just how, um, and it's been made a meme so many times, but just that normal wasn't working. And I think that the pandemic has, uh, really pulled back uh, the uh, where where was uh, the Wizard of Oz? He pulled back the curtain <laughs> on, on on the problem of, that we've been having for so long. Because at first I was kind of reluctant to think of racism as a public health crisis, just because we know how racism has shaped our society. But I think that now that we can see, you know, where where do where are resources going? Why are these people dying of the virus at a higher rate? I'm still struck by. Uh, the former president's comments that you know people are dying that are never that have never died before, meaning that normally these communities would have these resources available to them, but but they're running out because you know and and, and then there's some communities who's just never had access to access to resources at all, and so I think that you know again that's been uh, the eye opening experience, and and the reason why we're holding on to this language I'm, I'm kind of. Um, leery of, of, of just how we use language, even saying like, oh, I can't breathe when we can. <laughs> like we, 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 we are now breathing. So that means that we still have work to do. But I, I can go on a tangent about language. You all can please push back on me there. But I just think like framing it in the way that Dr. Cooper and Dr. Williams did in terms of thinking of, it, of racism as a public health crisis, you all made it make sense for me. So I appreciate that. Uh, the only thing I wanted to say about uh, racism as a public health crisis, I certainly agree with with all the comments. Um, so the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County and many cities throughout the state of Ohio have all come out with these statements uh, declaring racism as a public health crisis. And um, to your point, uh, Dr. Bula, about language, you know, I always wonder, um, is language enough? And for a lot of uh, the leaders out there, they feel good that they've made that declaration and then they kind of go back to their respective corners and keep, keep doing what they've always done. What I will give Cuyahoga County credit for is they did go a step further and they established, um, as you heard in, in the intro in my bio, they established a 17 member citizens advisory council on equity under the guise of racism as a public health crisis. And our charge was to is to look at all aspects of county government 
and to give them honest feedback about where they're uh, not doing so well, where there are weaknesses, where, where, where things could be done differently. And we are to write reports to the county council and the county executive twice a year on our findings. And uh, it has been absolutely phenomenal and a real eye-opening experience for me to sit in rooms with heads of various county agencies because you start to peel the onion and you can see why things happen and what structural racism looks like. Um, just a couple of quick examples. Uh, we were meeting with the Department of Children and Family Services who were quick to say, oh, you should know, you probably aren't surprised that over 80% of all the kids that we take out of homes are African-American kids. And um, we talked a bit about that. And uh, I asked the question, um, what kind of training uh, do your social workers get that go out and do this, you know, heroic, but obviously very challenging uh, work and, they, and it was something like uh, 35 hours a, a year that they have to get. And I said, is that a statewide thing? Is that just the county? She said, no, it's a statewide. Every, every social worker in, in the state has to do those 35 hours. So my response was, well, if you're in a place like Cleveland, that's number one in poverty, that's, uh, you know, number one in, um, you know, infant mortality, number one in the digital divide. I mean, I can go on and on. Is 35 hours really enough? Have, maybe we should rethink, you know, the kind of training that you uh, provide for those working in distressed communities. Many could argue the same about police, right? Um, secondarily, uh, totally off, uh, off the, the mark, um, but it was a surprise when um, we, we learned um, that the, uh, what is it, the county, um, I forget the uh, department, but they're responsible for roads and bridges, the, the, uh, the engineer, the county engineer. And um, basically we had a great conversation and the county executive agreed with the fact that um, when they make decisions about what bridges are gonna be repaired, what major infrastructure improvements are gonna happen, are you putting an equity lens on that to ensure that a certain percentage of those dollars are in fact going to black neighborhoods? Because if you're not thinking about it, if you're not mindful, you just continue to support the uh, well-held communities, if you will, and, and continue to make them stronger and more vibrant and you continue the disinvestment in communities of color. So there are so many things that could be done when you start to peel the onion, get behind the curtain and start to ask questions and really challenge policymakers, lawmakers, bureaucrats on, you know, are you really truly looking at this through an equity lens? And um, I think we have made progress already and uh, we certainly hope that we, we can make a lot more progress in the coming uh, months and years. Excellent. I want to shift slightly, um, and uh, we saw in um, this last election, particularly in Georgia, what uh, what some would call a minor miracle um, in terms of of, uh, of what happened there. We saw unprecedented turnout, um, but anecdotally, I, I haven't done a study on it, but my perception, I noticed it in 2016 and 2020. Uh, the courses in the black community who say that it really does not mm -hmm. matter if we vote doesn't matter who who we like doesn't matter who's in office um so you know that that whole thing and particularly under with with younger um younger people this notion that does really does not matter how would how would you respond to that that perception that it, it, it doesn't simply does not matter who we elect Or do you agree? <laughs> In some ways I do. Um, I mean, I'm a strong proponent of voting. I always vote. Uh, we encourage our families to vote. I do think it matters, but it, I'm hard pressed to give some young people um, a good answer to this question, Pastor Cooper. Um, I mean, I won't get into I work at a very unusual um, institution and, you know, I work with the crowd that they don't believe in the two party system. They believe Democrats are just as bad as Republicans. I mean, that's that's the group that I deal with. And so um, for them, it, it doesn't matter because there are there are only two options usually and they they rebel against that. Um, but also some that aren't too hung up on that. Uh, they don't necessarily see the growth 
or the difference or the benefits to the masses, just the regular ordinary people in our neighborhoods. And that's, that's their litmus test. They're not looking at um, who made it as president or, um, you know, who's heading a, a, a Fortune 500 company. They're looking at the neighborhoods and at the grassroots level, and they are not. So maybe um, Dr. Bueller wanted to start with the positive. So maybe we need to reframe um, uh, the question or um, be able to point to those areas where there are some successes and where elections do make a difference, particularly at the local level. Uh, I feel like we're in a stronghold area here in the Dayton area. Um, it, it specifically when it comes to our representation on the state level, uh, we can't win statewide elections. And so, um, but anyway, in terms of these young people, uh, you know, they don't want to hear. We have lots of examples. We have lots of examples from the 60s and 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 how voting make, made a difference and how our poor parents fought for voting rights and is still doing that. They they don't even want the history lesson doesn't even work for um, this generation. And so I'm not really answering your question other than I struggle with with the question myself. Maybe my colleagues on the panel have better answer. I wouldn't say it's necessarily a better answer, Dr. Cooper, but I will say this. Um, I think uh, one thing that um, is really excites me excites me as a historian is um, getting people to understand how to create new institutions. And what excites me about like being in Franklin County right now, um, um, this is going to go to the national level again, but. Um, uh, one of our uh, representatives was challenged by a young activist for the first time and um, in about maybe seven years or so, seven, eight years. And so I think what I want to give young people is the opportunity to think about, um, and, it, and, and it seems kind of hopeless and daunting, but when you push up against a system that is so old, it can seem that way, but I'm always trying to get young people to think about how do they create something new, right? You don't like the two-party system, then how do you galvanize around someone like a young, uh, I'll say her name, Morgan Harper, for example, an activist who ran against Joyce Beatty uh, last year. And it's like, okay, she, she, we knew that she was going to lose just because of the way politics work sometimes is politics at least in black America operates a lot like the black church like the the pastor can be there for 30 40 years and then try to figure out well how how come you can't get young people involved in the church anymore well you've been there forever right and so you know it, we like a, when I think about black politicians some of them have been in their post for a very long time and so it's like yeah galvanize around these young people who want to see something different um no, you're not, you know, necessarily going to be able to topple the entire two party system this time around, but keep cracking at it. Keep cracking at it. So vote, <laughs> you know, it may, you know, your candidate is probably not going to win, but you can still find a way to get into that system and make a small crack in, in what's already been established. Now, I know some people will say, well, if you vote for this person, we'll take away from this particular candidate and then we'll have this again. Well, I mean, you know what? We've been going through hell for a very long time as Black people. <laughs> so it's like, it's, 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 to, to, to be brief, <laughs> we need to continue to organize and find new ways to create and push movement. Like, I think sometimes... Um, we need to realize that it's not going to happen in a sprint. It's, this is a marathon. So just run your race, pass your baton, but keep trying to crack away at the system. So definitely, I think that we should we should tell young people to vote, but we should make sure that they have a sound political education, figure out why they want to vote for the particular candidates that they want to vote for. And then even if you think that person is going to lose, still make your voice count to say, like, these are the type of people that we want as our leaders. And you do that by just these little small movements. We do have, uh, we talk about the establishment in Washington. Well, I don't, but you know, that language is used um, career politicians versus the newbies. And we have that within, um, we have that within the black community as well. And so we have the career 
um, leaders um, and someone new comes along, they're to await their turn um, when they have um, fresh ideas and um, ability um, to make a difference. Um, we saw that happen um, with an election here and where I live, um, it wasn't necessarily um, a black candidate, but that young group, that young progressive group got behind a candidate who was running against um, someone who was considered, um, you know, part of the establishment. And I think that conversation we need to have in house um, and how to um, what you were saying, Dr. Beale, encourage, um, you know, some of our, our younger people who, you know, are probably even more qualified than some of our career politicians when they were starting out just in terms of their education and experience and in touch with their community. So I, I agree with you in terms of, um, but it's not just them. We, and I feel old now because I'm talking about the younger generations as them, <laughs> um, but we have to get, um, we have to get behind them and support them. What? Yeah, well, what? I, 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 I did. I did want to say one, uh, a couple of quick things, uh, Pastor Cooper. Um, I believe that we as a, a black and brown communities need to understand the art and science of holding elected officials accountable. Uh, I do federal lobbying work on behalf of my employer and uh, spend a fair amount of time in Washington, have sat down with numerous members of the House and the Senate. And um, it amazes me uh, when you see big business go in and lay down demands how uh, things get, can get done. And um, obviously uh, they're writing big checks and they, they bring a, a, a pretty good amount of influence because they can sort of tout, hey, I have X number of uh, employees in your district, so it's in your best interest to listen. But I also think that there are things that can be done and are being done uh, on a smaller scale, but still uh, by everyday people that are bold enough to sort of ask and challenge their elected officials, be it local, state or federal, to do their part. Um, one of the beauties of uh, Lou Stokes, uh, the first uh, African-American congressman for Ohio, was that he was accessible. He listened to his constituents and he took uh, those thoughts and concerns to Washington and turned it into legislation and saw to it that dollars came back. Um, I, I, I like to say to young people that, uh, you, you know, um, I remember the elders used to tell us that everybody that was um, uh, black wasn't your friend and everyone that was white wasn't your enemy. I would say that everyone that's democratic is not your friend and not everyone that's a Republican is not your enemy. Um, you, you, we, we have to learn to sort of work both sides and, and to bring people together around and, and be so steeped in the work that you're trying to do that you don't really let politics get in the way. I'm, I'm very proud to report, ladies and gentlemen, that for two years, uh, I worked directly with uh, State Senator Sandra Williams on a piece of legislation that I actually uh, picked up from a state senator in Texas. And it was around uh, the whole um, police uh, traffic stop interaction piece. And uh, it was called the Civilian Interaction Bill with Senate Bill 16. And uh, after two years of going back and forth, uh, we were into December of last year. And um, obviously, if you don't get those bills passed during that lame duck, everything sort of gets washed away and you have to start over. So we were pretty desperate. And all the members of the House were telling me, if you don't get to the Republicans, Randy, this thing is not going to pass. And I called on as many Republicans as I knew, and I told them to introduce me to other Republicans. And we got that bill passed. Uh, the governor signed it. Uh, it, it. It was voted out of a the Senate on December 22nd. So, you know, eight days before it would have had to go back to the drawing board. Uh, the bill requires that um, when young people um, get their driver's permit and they get the little study for their driver's permit, they get the little booklet that you have to learn the laws and everything. Language would not be included in that booklet on what to do if you're stopped by the police, what your rights are, that kind of a thing. That'll be a permanent addition to that uh, driver's manual. That same language will, will now be uh, mandatorily included in safety officer training so that the, as people are learning to become safety officers, they're reading the exact same language and learning the exact same information as the, the typical driver. Uh, the, the, the legislation also calls for the Department of Public Safety and the Department of Education 
to um, make it mandatory that every high school in the state have a class or a workshop on what to do if you're stopped by the police for high school kids, including role plays. And uh, the same is true that uh, this has to now become a part of any driving school has to include in their curriculum. So um, I, I spoke twice personally with the governor about it and told him why I thought it was important. And he listened and he supported it. Um, I spoke to several Republicans that got me to the Speaker of the House and, and others who ultimately you know, supported it. So that's what, 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 we, what more can we be talking about that's as important as traffic stops, right? That, that's what has just been devastating to our community all over this country for the last several years. And I, I just like to say, if one person can learn to think a little differently when they're stopped by the police as a result of this legislation pass, this passing, it's worth it. Um, but it's just a lesson that, you know, we all can do what we can do if we're sort of open to asking and challenging and, and being unafraid and uh, being bold. And when, when you care about your communities and you love your people and you want your, you know, teenage kids to come home, you know, you, 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 whatever the case may be, you know, you, you learn to fight for these things and, uh, you know, be unapologetic about imploring, you know, these elected officials to, to do the right thing. Pastor Kufu, if I may just add in one thing real quick um, to, to go along with what um, everyone has, has, has shared. Um, what are we voting for? I think is the question. I, I really appreciated what Dr. Cooper said and also what um, uh, Dr. Beulah and, and uh, Brother Randall, uh, Brother McShepard said as well. Um, but what are we voting for? What are we getting in return for our votes is always the question because that's it's a transactional relationship, but it also has moral and spiritual and cultural you know, ends to it as well. And oftentimes we are um, uh, encouraged uh, and sought out, but at the end of the day, they say the ends justify the means, but our outcome does not um, equal or equate to our input in terms of delivering uh, the goods for um, uh, the Democratic Party, or even for, for politics in general. Uh, you can go back historically to the uh, Republican Party when there were radical Republicans. And people, whenever their interests supersede our need, they can hem and haw or uh, kind of abdicate responsibility. But if we are delivering, then we need to have our voices centered. And, and I'll, I'll end by saying, at the local level, all politics is local. When you talk about city budgets, and in uh, the Northeast Ohio Black Health Coalition uh, headed by Ivanka Hall just developed a, an African-American rescue plan. Uh, going back to what are we getting for our vote? We can be um, asked to vote, but at the end of the day, if we're not equal partners and always um, having a seat at the table or have people come to us in a spirit of equal part uh, um, partnership, then it doesn't feel as if we are. Uh, if in a budget of over $541 million, wherever it came from, the suggestion that $371.4 million automatically without any conversation would go to police in a time where you've had protests all over the country and all over the world without any consideration of the community's input and needs, you have uh, bridges that are, are, are deteriorated streets, you have schools, you have lead, infested homes that have debilitating health standpoint and, and so many other things, mass incarceration uh, that does not equate into crimes being committed that has happened for quite some time, then I'm curious about your moral and spiritual center. Now, I'm not talking about uh, perfection because none of us have that, but where are our priorities? Where is our conscience in terms of that being the centerpiece that guides everything we do? And so uh, at the local level and certainly at the state level, you know, and, and for, for saying these things, then we are censored in silence and stigmatized and, and challenged. But which is worse, having to deal with these things continuously or living and dying in situations that no human being should have to even exist in? So I think that uh, we, we have to, and people are, all of a sudden people have been activists and, and, and leaders and people more skilled than I ever will be. Um, have been raising their voices in clarion calls all across this country. And it has rang and shouted throughout the cauldrons and the, the, the echo throughout the, the hills and valleys and, and, and other places within this country. That's what's making this administration potentially the most transformative administration in 
America and world history, because necessity has met opportunity and it's been collectivized. It's not just ind individual liberty, it's collective social responsibility. That's what's getting people in corporate America to, to back the voting rights when normally profits would you know, precede you know, getting into a moral or spiritual battle. And so it's, it's unnerving, it's unsettling, it's painful, it's hurtful on top of the mounds and mounds of pain we've been experiencing, but it's necessary. And I, I'm hopeful that it will continue because we all are being reawakened in this third, fourth, or fifth reconstruction, whichever it is. And I think that we'll you know, make out of this old world a new world, as Dr. King said, but hopefully not have to, com not have, to uh, have the same sacrifice that he and so many others had to give, but we will share the burden. And so that's why, I'm, uh, again, I'm thankful to be on this panel today because this is continuous work and, 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 and political leaders, when they are elected, when they take that oath, need to take, you know, take the responsibility, we serve the people. Uh, and, and, and that's the first and foremost um, obligation that we must wake up with and go to bed at night, um, being committed to. Thank you. So I hear in several of your responses that, that some of the apathy has to do with the, the perception that nothing is changes no matter who's in office and here you're talking about accountability um and so so really voting voting in and of itself is not the end it is the beginning um and we know power can seize nothing without a demand so what what should be some of our demands what would an agenda look like for us to present to um politicians and to, and to follow through what what would it look like if, if we if we actually had political power what would be different Well, Pastor, uh, that, that is a, a wonderful question. Uh, and, and I'm glad you, you brought it up because one of the things I have seen <clears throat> is, um, first of all, with all that's happened in our country over the last year or so, there are a lot of people of, with power, influence, and money that are genuinely saying, what can we do? And the big and, and, and this is like a moment in time. We, we, we all have been around this this planet for a long time. And we know I can't remember ever, you know, folks coming up to me or calling me saying, hey, uh, what, what can I do? I really want to you know, try to make an impact. So I think we as a community should have an urban. Uh, our, our think tank is working on an urban agenda. I love what Yvonne Hall did. I heard her on the radio the other day talking about, hey, look, here's some ideas of what you might do with that $541 million that's coming to the city of Cleveland. But whatever the plan is, whatever we think is right, we should be able to spell it out, articulate it, argue, fight for it, uh, and not, you know, him and ha. And the worst thing we could do is not have a plan, uh, not have some, some recommendations. Um, uh, I think uh, to, to be a bit more specific, um, and I'll close, um, we need to talk about all the issues that all of these wonderful panelists uh, have covered today. I mean, we should talk about where we stand with our uh, public schools. Uh, we've, uh, in Ohio, um, the way we fund schools has been ruled unconstitutional multiple times. Uh, so what are we gonna do about that? We know when schools don't have resources, kids can't matriculate at the, the rates that their counterparts can. Uh, if, if they're hungry, uh, if, if they can't stay late, if they don't get the extra you know, tutoring support, if they don't have the, uh, the uh, computer at home to do their you know, um, uh, virtual class uh, assignments, all those things. You know, um, health disparities are rampant. Um, we know that uh, criminalization of African-American men in particular is just ruining families, ruining communities. We need black men to be role models, to step up and protect the families and fight for families. Uh, we're taking so many of them away. When they come back, they, they, they aren't in a position to you know, land jobs because they're sort of uh, frowned upon at that point. And uh, many of them really, most of them I would say, really want to you know, get back on track, find jobs, but they're oftentimes discouraged from that. Um, we should be talking about the, the quality of life in neighborhoods. Are there safe places to recreate? Um, are, are there, um, you know, is there attention being paid to the quality of homes as uh, Dr. Williams talked about? I mean, there's a lead safe coalition here in Cleveland dealing with the, the whole lead issue. Um, but uh, there, there's, a, there's a lot more where that came from. Uh, so, so there's, just, just, you pick your, your, your topic, there's um, just so much work 
to be done. Um, and um, I just hope that we can continue to have conversations like this that lead to action. And I'll just say that uh, to piggyback on what um, Brother McShepard said, uh, the current commission report, and, and Ivanka always tells us this, uh, provided excellent recommendations, but they were never followed. We can convene commissions till the chickens come home to roost, but if we don't implement at all levels of society what people um, put in place or suggested, and if it's not coming from the people themselves as having a, an equitable role in it, then we're still going to be struggling. And, and, I, and I would be remiss, and, and I'll, I'll end by saying, is I'm in Houston, Texas, and it's the uh, city um, that is represented by the uh, Honorable Sheila Jackson Lee, who heads, uh, um, who's been pushing for HR 40, um, which was instituted by the Honorable John, late John Conyers uh, out of Michigan to have a commission to study reparations. Um, and, and Ivanka always talks about as well that it, uh, racism is a public health crisis, but also we must, in terms of a restitution and restorative element, factor in reparative justice, reparations, whatever you want to call it, as an element. Uh, those, the wealthy call it tax cuts. Um, people in communities need uh, these same things. So this commission to study all across this country and, and convenings are happening. We already have things happening in Evanston, Illinois, uh, and the other cities now that are having some form of this happen. But it's going to take a, uh, a, a, a systemic level um, that connects the Urban League's uh, domestic Marshall Plan with what may come from an HR 40 pass commission to really um, provide from sea to shining sea all that needs to uh, be remedied. But it's best for the nation if we do it and do it now. Yeah, uh, again, um you know, I think if the panel was meant to uh, have any form of disagreement, this panel has been on the same on one accord. So that's beautiful. So I can't I can't uh, argue with anything that I've heard. Um, but also, too, I just think like maybe three days ago, I was reading a report um, coming out of uh, I think out, out of out of Cleveland on the upcoming um, voting overhaul. There's a bill coming to. Uh, think about some more restrictions. So I think to answer your question, uh, Pastor Cooper, we need to think about uh, expanding voter right, voting rights and not restricting them. Um, also, um, I'm intrigued by a report that I saw coming out of Newark, New Jersey. Newark um, has not had uh, one police shooting in 2021 due to some commission that they've put together and resources going back into that community. And of course, with respect what's going on here in Columbus, Ohio, where we've had another kid killed by the cops and Columbus, Ohio is number two in the nation for uh, uh, killing children, black children. And so I think that whatever Newark is doing, <laughs> I haven't read the article, I just saw it before we, I hopped on actually, we need to figure out how to you know, redirect resources into communities um, and not so much on, I mean, cause I think on redirecting resources. I don't talk about training, but I think training is something that they get enough of. We need to redirect resources. Um, so those those are two things that I can think of to, to answer your, your last question. I agree with uh, Dr. Bueller in terms of the uh, agreement with this uh, among this panel and um, Randell stole my thunder about the uh, funding of, of education here in the state of Ohio, but I think it's so important, I'm going to mention it again, that it's been declared unconstitutional for years, um, and we continue, um, uh, you know, with that unconstitutionality, and we need to do something about it. So in terms of a Black agenda, I don't know that we really need to recreate the wheel. I think there are grassroots organizations that are laying it out. If you look at the state of Black America that the Urban League puts out, they cover almost every sector and factor. Um, of black life and I think we can look there um, so folks who are already doing the work and how can we um, how can we uh, adjust that uh, if you will um, for our state and for our communities in terms of what the national issues are um, but I, I think I will mention a, a couple things that um, maybe weren't mentioned of course finances um, um, all three of you have mentioned that in some way I was actually feeling a bit optimistic 
about this panel until um, Dr. Williams just spoke and uh, this really put me back in a, in a sp space of reality in terms of where we really are. Um, but uh, not just funding of our schools, but state budgets and how can we make a difference um, uh, you know, in our communities uh, where the funding comes from, you know, how can we uh, create our own? Um, and I'm, I'm leaning a little bit on Dr. Bueller in terms of uh, the answer to young people and, uh, and their um, discouragement with, with the voting um, system. But, you know, how can we create a black fund of some sort that, that will fund some of these grassroots organizations that aren't getting funded by the major um, funders. They're not really getting funded by the Dayton Foundation and the Cleveland Foundation and other, you know, these um, entities that have major works or money, or they are funding what they see as safe projects or safe people. Um, but what about those that are really getting at the heart of our communities? How are those, you know, Ohio Student Association, for example, these young people are doing major work in activism and, um, you know, how are they funded and how can we collectively um, you know, pull together our resources to fund some of these grassroots level, um, grassroots, grassroots work, I'm sorry. Environmental justice has to be a part of the plan. For too long, we shied away from that because, you know, the movement was really hijacked to just mean trees and plants and lands. Um, um, and now it's moved more into the justice realm in terms of how it's impacting black and brown people. And so I think that has to be part of the agenda. I think that the concept of reparations is not dead. And I think you know, many of us uh, want to avoid that because it's so controversial, but I think we still need to consider that concept of reparations and how it might impact our communities. Um, I think we have to look at fighting for a national living wage, um, national and statewide in terms of helping the economics of our people. And lastly, I know this is a different panel, but I want to put a plug in for black women leadership. And if we look at what's happening across some of our cities with black women in leadership and as mayors, Keisha Lance Bottoms. And I mean, I, you know, I can call the names. Uh, maybe we need a Stacey Abrams type person in the state of Ohio. Um, and then looking at the mayoral races and all these other races. And I'll, I'll just stop there. I don't want to move into a panel that already happened this morning. Can I just add, uh, Dr. Cooper, really quickly, um, you, you mentioned not reinventing the wheel, and in the chat box, I'm going to put a link to the um, uh, National Poor People's Campaign platform, because it speaks to a lot of the uh, issues that you were saying about in terms of having a living wage, you know, adequate housing, and I also wanted to add that, um, you know, there's groups like Fight for 15 that are in uh, North Carolina, and I was talking with one of those activists and they were basically saying that, you know, they fund them, they fund themselves, like they figure out ways to share, you know, resources. And I think that that's something that um, that we can learn from is just how do we take care of each other? How do we share the resources that we have? Um, because we know that sometimes when uh, big money gets involved, um, these conversations, you know, the vision can change a great deal. And so I think that if we get people who are willing to fund themselves, and, and share resources that that's that's just another idea but i'm gonna put that uh, link in the chat thank you um so most most of us uh, have been um, dealing with uh, the racial injustice issue for probably as long as we can remember um the fight has been going on for 400 plus years um we've been um We've gone through various um, movements. And so what, what can we learn from, from the past, what has already taken place? What can we learn from the strategies, from the, the victories, from the defeats of, of the past? And, and what do we need to do differently? How do we need to re-envision um, the, the fight for, uh, against racial injustice? I'll, I'll go. I think uh, I'm so obsessed with the Panthers and uh, and just how they just took good care of their communities that um, that they were you know branched out in. Uh, I, I just think like yo, like if we could before before they will infiltrate it with crack cocaine, 
um, before, you know, egos kind of took over what they were doing in terms of providing, you know, I mean, our whole head start system that we have in America comes from the Panthers. <laughs> so we think about what they were doing in, in neighborhoods in terms of providing health clinics, uh, good food, uh, after school tutoring, uh, you know, taking, uh, taking, uh, 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 Policing the police, <laughs> if you will, if we could go back and look at, you know, what didn't work, if we can go back and look at, because I'm, obs I'm obsessed with those people who are on the wrong side of history. Like, you know, we, we talk so much about Martin, but not enough about Malcolm. Uh, we don't talk very much about uh, Bayard Rustin or even Vernon Johns, these people who were doing this great work, but because they did not fit into modes of respectability, we have dismissed their work. But if we go back and really study, you know, take the time to study some of these people that are, you know, kind of mentioned in the footnotes of King studies um, and think about what they were doing and and, and realizing like, yo, we, we can absolutely do this, the, the same thing. And I'd be willing to, if anyone wanted to reach out to me, I'd be willing to send out some uh, bibliographies for resources. But I think it, it starts with a commitment to, to really sitting down and studying history and then thinking about taking those very practical steps. Because um, I mean, Fannie Lou Hamer, she, she didn't have a degree at all. So it's just decided one day, like, okay, these young people are here. <laughs> they, they, want, they want to get me to vote. And she just did it. And then she just emerged because she felt empowered to do so. And I think that we can do those same things. And I think that um, going back to what uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Myla Cooper was saying before, in terms of thinking about women, when we think about September Clark and Ella Baker and their strategies and approaches to organizing are the very things that we can do uh, right now. One of the things we learn from the past, um, there are different movements in different eras, but specifically in the civil rights era, um, young people uh, were leaders. Young people really led that movement. I mean, even the public facing leaders were young. Um, and then the foot soldiers were college age students. And um, I think that's a lesson that we can learn in terms of how we empower, embrace fund, uh, encourage um, our young people who are um, engaged in this work and those of us who can touch students um, where they are who are discouraged um, and, but somewhat apathetic in terms of their involvement, we can share those lessons with them and encourage them, point them to organizations and um, you know ways to, to be involved. And I would also say another lesson that we learn is that, um, as Martin Luther King said, I think the arc of the universe is long, um, but it bends towards justice to try to remain hopeful um, because these are urgent issues. These are, you know, we're in a crisis, you know, an existential crisis, but um, there aren't any quick fixes. And, you know, um, Dr. Coop, as you mentioned, you know, we've been doing this as long as we can remember. Um, and so, yes, there, you know, there's a sense of exhaustion and tired and we, um, <laughs> you know, we can't do it all, but, you know, I remain hopeful and maybe if we, you know, talk about why and, and from the spiritual perspective, but, you know, I remain hopeful um, with um, expertise on this panel, folks who I know who are doing the work and some of the young people that I'm involved with, um, you know, in my area or on college campuses, um, but it's, we have to remember that quote you know, that it, it does bend towards justice and um, our people have been fighting for centuries and victories have been won. And so we have to continue to believe in that in terms of um, the lessons and how we move forward. And I would just add, uh, I, I agree with those uh, <clears throat> brilliant comments from uh, Dr. Bula and Dr. Cooper. Um, my response kind of goes back to the last question as well as this question. Um, I think uh, one thing we could benefit from from yesteryear was um, Black people supporting Black people. Um, you know, back, uh, there was a time when you couldn't do it any other way, right? I mean, you know, if you, if you needed a service, you, you could only get it from someone that looked like you because you didn't have the luxury of going elsewhere. And now uh, many, uh, people of color in business and other enterprises uh, are often disappointed that they can't seem to get, you know, the support from their community. And I think that that 
uh, can be hurtful. Um, I, I wanted to share um, uh, to Dr. Buell's point that people, uh, well, two points. One, to, to Dr. Cooper's point, I wanted you to know, you'll be glad to know that the Cleveland Foundation established something called the Black Futures Fund. And it's strictly for black founded or black led organizations. And they just, this uh, couple of months ago had their first call for proposals and received 223 proposals. And everyone sort of said, oh my God, we didn't know there were that many black organizations, you know, in the state, let alone, uh, you know, in, in little old Cleveland. But uh, so I wanted you to know that, uh, Myla, but I, I also um, wanted to uh, share a little story about a project that I'm involved with, uh, the Riddle Green Partnership. Uh, this is a project that deals with environmental uh, justice as well as uh, food insecurity. Um, and myself and two uh, childhood friends came up with this idea 10 years ago. We went into an area in Cleveland known as the Forgotten Triangle. It was the most notorious illegal dumping site in the city. Burned out cars, dead bodies, uh, refrigerators, we worked with the county um, illegal dumping task force and unearthed over 2,000 tires. I mean, this was just a dump that nobody went to. We started by investing our own money into this project to get it off the ground because we wanted to educate our people on the importance of healthy eating. And a couple of our uh, partners are have been vegan for 20, 25 years. And uh, we said, when you look at heart disease, diabetes, uh, obesity, cancer, so much of that has to do with diet. and uh, and our communities, uh, drive-throughs are killing far more people than drive-bys. So, you know, what, what can we do to address this? Uh, I'm proud to report that we started with 1.3 acres with just a couple of uh, greenhouses. We've expanded over 10 years to now uh, controlling 15 acres. Uh, we have two hoop houses, six hoop houses. We have an EPA licensed compost facility. We have spun off a tilapia fish farming business with private investors that's now selling fish to local restaurants. Uh, we, we can't grow the fish fast enough. The demand has been through the charts, off the charts. We, we just opened up a community kitchen building on that campus that we will use to uh, teach cooking classes, teaching people how to prepare their food, to eat healthy. And a few days a week, we'll run it as a healthy food um, restaurant with uh, including uh, vegan brunches on Sunday. and. Uh, all of that led to us being asked and we accepted uh, taking over operations of a farmer's market in Maple Heights, which is now an 80% African-American community. And um, we uh, run a seven day fresh food uh, farmer's market there. And the mayor tells us that if uh, that market, which had been closed by the previous owners and we opened it back up, that if that market was not there, that that whole section of Maple Heights would have been a food desert. So. Through all of this, we've created 18 jobs. We have ex-offenders, we have you know, all sorts of folks with life challenges that are doing phenomenal work. Uh, and uh, we went from you know, uh, cobbling together $40,000, $50,000 10 years ago to you know, a lot of out-of-pocket money to now um, uh, having a close to a $2 million operation. So uh, that's just an example, small example of when folks come together and lean on each other and make a commitment to the community, great things will happen. So um, I, I, I just wanna see so many more of those kinds of things happen and I know it's possible. I want to applaud you, Randall. You know, we go way back and um, put in the chat, um, game changer, changer, major influencer. I'm just so inspired and admire your work. And the question I would have is, um, well, really for all of us, how do we duplicate some of those efforts? And so you ask about a blueprint or um, an agenda. Um, you know, I know you've convened some think tanks and, you know, maybe we need to see more of that um, so that, you know, in Dayton, Ohio, for example, we can glean from some of the things that are happening in Cleveland, um, you know, like a statewide think tank, because I don't believe we have to, you know, reinvent the wheel when major things are going on. And so um, this type of sharing is awesome. I used to, um, I think, mention to Randall, he should run for the mayor of Cleveland. Or I know I wasn't the only one. Um, and now I'm thinking governor. Um, <laughs> But we but we need folks in 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 spaces um, like where you are. We need we need folks in, in you know in all of these sectors. Um, so thank you for your work. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. You're very kind. 
And and what you were just talking about, uh, Miranda, sort of leads me into my next question. Um, you know, as, as we talk about um, addressing issues of racial injustice and, and we have a vision of, of, of what we hope to see, uh, we still live in the, in the now. And, you know, so what are some things we can do um, even as we continue to fight against racial injustice, how can we minimize this effect? How can we rise above it? How can we thrive in spite of it? What are some things that we can do um, even as we continue to fight uh, against it? We have to take care of ourselves. Um... I, you know, I refuse, I absolutely refuse, even though I look at this bleak picture that we, you know, that we call the United States and our, and, and where we are, all the things that we're talking about. And, you know, Zach really did a gut punch for me, Dr. Williams rather, in terms of how he articulated some things, but even amidst of all of this pain and suffering and white supremacy, I refuse to go through life without joy. And so I think, um, that's it for me. And how do we encourage our people? Um, because we, we, we have moments of joy. We have things to celebrate. Um, we have a rich, rich culture. We enjoy each other. And um, so I think we have to celebrate the small wins, the small victories. Um, and we, all, we have to find things that um, bring us joy um, individually, but also as a community. You know, what Randell was saying about supporting each other. Um, we have to do that. And self-care is not, uh, we have a young person here who started this organization with the phrase self-care isn't selfish and it's not. And self-care is a form of, of resistance and rest is resistance. And so for me, uh, you know, in my own walk, um, you know, trying to take care of myself, trying to say no, um, even when it feels like we're going um, backwards to be able to pause, to reflect, um, to refresh and renew, um, knowing that, and I think that's a lesson that we can learn um, from the past, you know, in terms of the social justice warriors and freedom fighters, uh, they, they were uh, fighting the fight, but they also, they rested and they, um, they took care of themselves. Um, some might argue that point, but, you know, from some of the history lessons, that's what I, I've learned. Um, from previous movements. So, so again, I would just say we, we have to take care of ourselves and hold on to our joy. I know um, being inside over <laughs> this last year has given me a lot of time to, to dig into um, uh, African spirituality and just thinking about what it means to uh, uh, one, to worship as enslaved people worshiped, um, but also thinking about some of the uh, religious traditions throughout the diaspora that we've been, um, some of us who have come up in Christian churches have taught, been taught to demonize because um, we don't understand it, but really tapping into the spirituality of our, of our ancestors in addition to cultivating joy and practicing rest, but also thinking about what it means to call on the ancestors for help and for assistance um, has been um, really enriching for me. So I offer that into that space. I appreciate um, uh, Dr. Bula and Dr. Cooper, your sharing that and, and how in, in both African spirituality is not being uh, something that is um, outside of our tradition, but it's still central. It's a building block. And even though it's not recognized formally, yet and still it's important to us. And, and that connects with what you said, Dr. Cooper, about joy but I would expand our definition of joy to include the full gamut of, of, of what we feel and being unapologetic and being able to express it whenever, uh, why ever, uh, and in whatever way we choose. We've earned that right, I think, as a people. And we've been so policed, so censored, um, and whether it's how we love, who we love, uh, or how we uh, worship or, 
uh, how we uh, react to events, um, even the brutality. We were expected to not act in a way that rose to the level of the, the issue. And, and it just makes me you know, wonder when can we be and where can we be, whether it's the, uh, a baby or, or an elder. And we live in communities that are, you know, vo devoid of, you know, the things that are um, on the level of our humanity and, and the dignity that we show. And, and dignity is not just uh, something that we demonstrate in quiet or in one fashion. We, you know, we have a variety of ways. And so I'm glad you both mentioned that because oftentimes we don't give ourselves grace. We don't give ourselves the opportunity to be ourselves. And we go and we work in places, and, and I'm, I know you all have know this and mentioned this, where we are expected to conform to a particular way and remove ourselves from ourselves. And then somehow at some point, reconnect ourselves some along, some way along the line before we get back to our spaces and places with our people. But even then, our, our politics with, it, with each other is very, very, very complicated as a result of all those other things. And so it's hard, but without the spirituality, without some expression of, you know, I would add to, to joy, freedom, then, you know, it, it makes it difficult for us to continue to go forward. But we found a way over generations to keep going. And so um, leaning on, on those powers are, are critical. I, I, I thank you all for sharing that. Excellent comments, Dr. Williams. Uh, the, the only thing I would add to this particular question um, is <clears throat> we as a community need to do all that we can to help develop the next generation of leaders. Um, leadership is lonely. Leadership is dangerous. Leadership um, it is uh, something that um, many people think they want until they get there and they realize, um, uh, as the old saying goes, uh, a, a local ele elected official told me once, um, you know, well, once, once you get a, a, above the radar, uh, that's when the, the enemy fire starts to come. So, you know, but, but people need to understand that, you know, if we don't stand up and lead, uh, nothing ever will change. And uh, that's the only thing that's gotten us to this point. We had bold people many of whom Dr. Bueller already named, that were willing to step out, risk their lives. Um, I'll tell you what, what the day when my whole civic walk changed is when I read um, Walking with the Wind um, by uh, 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 our, our departed uh, Congressman, John Lewis. Uh, there was a section where he talked about the, when the, bomb, the bus was bombed in uh, Birmingham that he and a, a group of maybe six students got together and said, we have to get on the very next bus going to Birmingham. That's the only way we can ensure that this continues and, and this, this, um, this fight continues. So they all sat in a room in silence and wrote their wills because they knew this is probably gonna be it. The bus before us got blown up and people were killed. But I just thought, man, if that's the level of commitment that these young 18, 19, 20, 21 year olds were willing to make so that I could vote, so that I could have a, a more rich life. Uh, you know, uh, it just goes to show that um, there's so much uh, room for, for leaders and leadership. And I think that uh, we have to groom and, and let people know that it's okay, even though the road gets bumpy and it gets scary, to step out and, and lead. I, I uh, through my think tank I, in 2019, I wrote a, a, a report called Missing in Action on the subject of leadership. And I really talked about black leadership and I talked about political, business, civic and community leadership. And it was so controversial. The front page, it was a front page story in a Sunday PD, half of the front page and the entire back side of the page. The, the person uh, that was heading up cleveland.com said that there was so many hateful comments on the comment section that they had to take the comments down after two hours and for the next three months, the, the whole town was just on fire with this, so much so that I was asked to be a, a speaker at the Cleveland City Club for a Friday forum to talk about this issue. The good news is 
all the young lions out there were fired up and they were calling me saying, thank you. And I, I now feel like I can run for office. I now feel like I can start this organization. I'm not, and, and for me, that's all it took. Now, over time, people uh, having a chance to debate and talk to people and, and state my case, you know, um, I think most people had to agree that leadership is a major issue and a major challenge, you know, that we have to overcome. But I just want, you know, our young leaders to understand that, you know, it, it's, it is scary, it is bumpy, but we don't get to where we want to go as a community if we don't develop, cultivate, encourage, you know, pray for and, and everything else, you know, the, the next generation of leaders and those in current leadership positions that are going through it. So just wanted to add that point. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, uh, when we talk about racial injustice, um, you know, we have to deal with, with power dynamics, uh, with um, systems and, and um, processes. It's, it's not simply a matter of, of a single issue, but, but there, there, there are systems in place. It, it did not, it's, it's not simply that somebody doesn't like you, uh, but they are entire systems that, that, um, that are in place that uh, hinder our ability to advance economically, um, to uh, access and develop uh, political power. And so um, I, I want us to spend um, just a, a little bit of time and we're almost out of time, um, but I, I want to, to talk and I'm first about about systems and um, just get your thoughts on what are what are some of the systems what are some of the power dynamics that really need to be addressed that that sort of keep us because sometimes we can we can you know we'll deal with a specific issue but we don't deal with this system behind it um, that uh, that really undergirds um, the oppression so so if you could just just um, Talk about what you see as as, um, as some of the systems behind the racial injustice that we need to address. I think my colleagues on the panel may have additional thoughts. Um, one of the systems that we've already mentioned is education. Um, and specifically, if we look at our own state and um, the inequities, um, in large part due to funding. And so the resources um, that a school has um, or that schools have um, based on your based on the zip code. Um, and we know how what the urban areas look like. And Randell brought up the um, the rural and the urban divide, and I haven't looked at at that in terms of our you know rural education, but we might find that too. But specifically, you know, in our urban centers, um, public education and the way it's funded, um, you know, gross um, misuse of um, power uh, in terms of those who who decide that, and so education is. I mean, I don't think we have to talk about the importance of education, especially um, primary education and, and when young people are, um, you know, beginning in um, some of the dilapidated buildings and not even that anymore, honestly, because we put the money in the buildings, um, but that's about the extent of it. Um, you know, what about the other resources that um, go into paying teachers and um, resources for teachers and opportunities for children, um, the whole nine yards. And so I think that's one system that is grossly inequitable in our state um, and perpetuates um, uh, perpetuates inequity. And I see it at the higher education level in terms of where our students come from and the way that they are prepared. And it doesn't mean we don't have scholars and geniuses in the inner city public schools. I'm not suggesting that at all. Um, but that's often in spite of that environment. They're getting their support from home or community organizations or their churches 
Um, and so, uh, you know, don't equate what I'm saying with, with our young scholars that, that, you know, come out of these schools. But that's, that's one system that I would point to. Right. See, the others there's are many, pondering there, that question. There, 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 there's, many, there's many systems out there. Um, I, I'll just throw one out there, and that's um, banking and financial systems. Um, when you think about the uh, egregious, you know, actions of bank banking institutions over the years, and how they have impeded. Uh, and uh, really limited people of color from uh, being uh, very involved in uh, redlining, as Dr. Williams mentioned earlier, um, you know, which uh, di dictating, you know, the value of housing, but then also keep in mind that the foreclosure crisis of just a few years ago um, eliminated uh, pretty much the bulk of all the wealth that had been generated for Black folks since the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Uh, and that was all a banking system situation. Um, so, uh, and, and, and to this day, you still hear uh, people of color in business saying they can't get loans. They can't, they can't get a phone call returned. They can't, you know, so we all know that uh, this is a capitalistic society and all we want is an opportunity to be a part of that, to, to shoot our best shot, to try our business idea. And uh, the doors are too often slammed uh, shut and, uh, you know, um, I think that that's just a great example of how systems really hurt us in any number of ways, because if, you know, if you can't start your business, if you can't, you know, uh, finance your home, um, you're already uh, a few steps behind the pack and uh, lots of other uh, terrible things start to happen at, in, as a result. Oh. As someone who works in a seminary, I have to think about the religious system. And, you know, if, if, if we as Christians don't uh, really uh, convey the fact that um, Jesus was a first century Palestinian Jewish carpenter, he was poor, <laughs> and that, you know, he was an organizer. And so we really have to do, um, I was in a conversation a couple of weeks ago about um, this Pew Research article about how young people are, you know, declining in church attendance. And it's like, yo, like, well, why? Like, I mean, because we have not done a good job of really presenting Jesus in his proper historical context. And I think that when we look at Jesus as an organizer, as someone who, you know, is developing the poor to speak truth to power, uh, I think people can get behind <laughs> a religious figure like that. So um, I think that we have to um, rescue the Bible um, and how the Bible is used to condemn poor communities. The Bible is used to condemn women um, and, you know, LGBTQ folk. And, you know, I think that we spend so much time on verses, but we, we don't, we, we can spend so much time in Leviticus on one verse, but if you go over to Leviticus 25, for example, there's a whole platform in Leviticus 25 about how we could run a society and how we could care for other people. And we, we kind of, we've let the Bible be reduced to these small things to, to, to push people out but we really should be thinking about how we use the book to bring people in. And I think that, you know, it just requires a, a rereading of, of Jesus in his proper historical context. I think we, we, and that's one way I think we start there by going back to the gospels, looking at what Jesus was doing and, 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 and uh, pulling in these other poor people to work with him. I think that's just so powerful. And I think that's just something that we could add as, as theologically uh, informed folk. Certainly add health care to uh, those uh, systems as well. Um, and that runs the gamut in terms of, you know, the role of racism in the healthcare setting, even in terms of um, the uh, development and uh, presentation uh, of vaccines you know, to communities. And that built upon a history of health disparities. So, uh, yeah. I would add, uh, thank you for that, Dr. Buell. I was over here shouting um, at my James Cone hat on too, God of the oppressed. Um, uh, mass incarceration, the 
justice system. We don't have time to go take a deep dive there, but you know, we see that all over um, the country um, with um, the justice system from the local level um, on up and mass incarceration is um, a major business. It's major. And that's why it's so hard to fight against because um, there are people who build their wealth um, on incarcerating black and brown folks. Thank you. And um, Dr. Beard, I don't, I don't know if your, your response was a segue to my next question or, or if it was a drop the mic um, statement uh, for my next question. Um, but, you know, when we talk about, about systems, you know, it's, it's important to talk about systems because if, you know, if you, you can remove the racist, but if the system is still in place, we're still going to have the same effect. Um, taking that a step further, um, even if we deal with the system, but we don't deal with the spirit, we don't deal with the heart then you can dismantle the system but a new system will come up if 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 spirits have not been changed a new system will, will arise to replace the old one mm -hmm. so um this is a, a probably a much more difficult question but how do how do we dismantle racism on a spiritual level on a hard level how do we go about that work. I think I, I see I'll the just, turn. <laughs> I was gonna say for me, off the top of my head, I go back again to the gospels and look at who 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 was Jesus spending time with? Who did Jesus empower? Who did Jesus build a relationship with? You know, who did he, uh, you know, dismiss or, or bring in? And I think that, uh, you know, so so interesting to me. Um, I forget who I was having a conversation with re recently, uh, but it's so interesting to me to think about that we, we form our whole relation, our whole religion on a man who said love God and love people, right? And, and he, he didn't say, he didn't put any, you know, qualifications on the people. It's just love people. And I just think that if we could really find ways to help people to, one, um, move away from the idea that, you know, salvation is, you know, just response to individual sins, right? But if we could get people to think about that because, you know, we, we now have this uh, invitation to God through through the person of, of, of Jesus that we too are like Jesus, and therefore we are able to do some of the same things that Jesus did. That it's not, it's just not about, that's why I said the historical Jesus, getting in touch with the historical Jesus, because I think that, again, um, our sister last night, Dr. Bostick, she, she talks so much about Howard Thurman, a, a person that I love, and I think about Thurman's work and his ability to connect with the divine. And I think if we can get people to realize that we are, we too are, are, are children of God, right? And, and so therefore we have this power to transform society by the power that's been invested in us because of this relationship. Like if we can get under people to understand uh, both their humanity and their divinity, we could do great works like Brother Randell is doing in, in, in Cleveland. Like, but but I think it's, you ha you also have to get people to get to an understanding of that that divine power is in them to do it, and it doesn't matter what their what their religion or culture is. Like, we are all divine beings, and I think that that's something that is helpful to thinking about. And I think we can do that better if we did our conversations around Christology better. I agree with that. Um, the sort of right evangelical Christian movement is hijacked. Um, the real Jesus, the historic Jesus, the social justice warrior, uh, even God, you know, God of the oppressed. Um, and so really recapturing and, um, you know, uh, reclaiming um, that for our religious institutions. Um, but, you know, part of that is, is for us in our, in our walk, in our fight, for example, looking at some basic tenets of, um, you know, we're not created to hate, we're created to love. And 
it, it's really nothing but God um, that prevents um, some of us, you know, those who try to stick with that, not to hate um, the oppressor and not to want to kill and, and, and bear arms. Um, serious. That's that holds me every time. <laughs> um, and I know, you know, we're not only talking about believers when we're talking about the black community, but, you know, thinking of, you know, the framing and who's sponsoring, um, you know, this particular institute, um, you know, we we have to draw on on, um, you know, on that on the book in terms of who God says we are in our own fight, you know, how we use that to actually reach hearts. Um, you know, one step at a time, because we already have people who use the same book who have hijacked, um, you know, you know, God as a liberator and um, religion as, you know, as liberation. And so um, I don't know how we create partnerships, how we, um, you know, create that dialogue at the beginning. We started at the beginning of this panel talking about whose problem this is, who whose problem, who created racism and who are the white supremacists and, you know, where are the believers in that group um, that need to hear, uh, learn, relearn um, who God of, God of, God of, who God is in terms of God being a God of justice and God of the oppressed. And so it's multifaceted, um, you know, for sure. But, you know, I, I think of, you know, this, this spiritual fight, um, that we talked about so many practical things and physical things. Um, but ultimately, I believe that um, we also win this fight on our knees. We, we win this fight by praying and fasting. And um, sometimes we get criticized for that because that's all we want to do is, is pray. No, um, I didn't hear anyone else. We didn't even start with this. We saved the last nine minutes for this. And so, um, but that is part of our fight in the spiritual realm. Um, this, in the spiritual battle. And um, we do that in concert with all of these practical and physical things that we do. And I, I add, uh, thank you. Um, how do we reconcile um, the brutality, the evil? Uh, I'm not, you know, theologically inclined. Uh, and definitely would lean on you, Dr. Bueller, to define in the appropriate theological context and Dr. Cooper. When you look at all these things, micro and macro, not economics, but in terms of the human experience, that does become um, profitable and disposable. Um, I mean, how do we even, in terms of systems, how do we even look at the, the structure and the architecture of, of, of laws and, and policies and things that, that are put in place that we are told are rational, that um, are normal, and that we should be governed by. How does that then juxtapose, how do we compare and juxtapose that with what we experience on a daily basis and that we even then subject to each other? Because if we can't, then express it to the people we really want to. I mean, I heard it put this way by uh, someone uh, near to me, hurt people hurt other people. But what's even worse is hurt people with power hurt even more people who already hurt in an even greater way. And that snowballs and it compounds and it affects our health, our mental, physical, spiritual, as Dr. Cooper said, and, and, and the environment's toxic that we are under the ground that we then go back into. So at every level of society and the systems and how, and how they interlock, and thank you, it's only by the grace of God or whatever being that we believe in that we are even here. Because when you look at all the statistics, Brother Randall, and everything that is put up and presented, there is no way in the world that we should be even in the position remotely that we are in. Um, so I don't know what it will take. Um, I wrestle and struggle myself. And I know we all do in various ways um, that people take delight and take joy in demeaning um, and disposing and discarding human beings. But that's in many ways, the opening in which we came into this country brought to this country in the halls of slave ships. Um, Native people, I mean, Raul Peck, Raul Peck's uh, documentary on HBO Max, Exterminate the Brutes, 
uh, talks about these things. And there's so many others, but yet still we, we prop up a, a very lucrative, Dr. Cooper, mass industrial complex that you know, profits off of labor, not just putting people in, but also companies and corporations who have people, you know, you know, the making products that then we buy and sell from that props up our consumer society globally. And how do we, exp it don't explain that away, but then have certain tried and true things that we then say, well, this is this and, and you know, and, and that's, that's how it is. So, and, 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 and the last thing I'll say is people tell us that there are limits to what is possible. Medicare for all, free college, you know, um, hiring in mass, um, you know, African-American women in, in leadership positions, dealing with maternal health issues, whatever the issue and subject, you know, um, letting political, you know, uh, prisoners go, I mean, you name it. Uh, people who, you know, have, have contributed a lot to our, our country, um, we say that there are limits to those things. But there are other things that are passed without any consideration. And so we know in our faith tradition, although I know it wavers because when you face a lot of things that we face, you have to wonder what's going on. Um, but we, we are kept in, in, in tow because of, of the groundedness of our faith that has come through a joy that has frustration, anger, uh, happiness, love, you name it, all wrapped up in it. Um, but I think we really have to see where, where that is right now. And I think that the coming weeks and months and years are gonna really indicate where America is but because we were said to be, when the Tocqueville came here, a moral society. Uh, I'm wondering, you know, at what level of, of a society, where is our morality now? And I think it's gonna show in terms of um, where we go from here. Thank you. Believe it or not, we are just about out of time. Um, but what I want to do, I'm going to give you before I turn it back over to Dr. Umberg, we want to give each of you um, 60 seconds or less to, to just give us some, some concluding thoughts, um, anything you'd like to, to leave us with. Um, clock is ticking. I would just say, um, first of all, it's, it's been a privilege to to be on this august panel. Um, I learned so much from our, each of uh, the fellow panelists and uh, thank you for a great job facilitating uh, Reverend Cooper. Um, I think that the George Floyd tragedy and many, many others that we've seen too many of, in my estimation has generated what I like to call a civic awakening. I think that there are many people from all walks of life and we saw there were, think about all the protests that happened worldwide. People from all over the world were so incensed by what they saw. And I think that um, I was reminded of a, a couple of Saturdays ago, I saw a gentleman who was on CNN um, who had been in prison for 20 something years. He was in solitary confinement for 18 years. And he said, if you, uh, if they would do what they did to George Floyd with the cameras on in the light of day, you just think about what happens to people of color everywhere else when the lights aren't on, uh, when the cameras aren't on. Um, so I say that all to say, we as people of color should be uh, very open to telling our story. You'll be surprised at how people accept and learn from our lived experience. And the more we can help to your question about, about how you, help soften hearts or, or, or just get to people uh, in different ways. Telling them things that you've experienced, tell them about your family, tell them about your community, tell them about why you do the work that you do. Uh, we don't have those conversations nearly enough. And I think if we can do more of that, we can really change the hearts and minds of uh, uh, the entire uh, global community. My gratitude to the panel, uh, read history and connect with folk who can uh, put, help you put those ideas that you're learning from history textbooks into action. I too uh, thank, 
thank the organizers, the moderator, and this esteemed panel. Um, I'm inspired and challenged um, to continue um, to do what I, my small part. Um, Dr. Williams mentioned what's going on, and I did a quick zo uh, Google search. It was Marvin Gaye actually, um, I think, wrote it in 1971, 50 years ago. Read the lyrics, read the lyrics. The same words apply. That's what Black America is asking the question, what's going on? Um, and this, um, this crisis, this pandemic, this public health crisis that we find ourselves in, um, why certainly um, economics, um, that's a big part of it, um, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't matter if you're poor, if you're wealthy, if you served your country, um, the Black and Latinx um, uh, officer that was stopped in Virginia, um, pepper spray, um, you know, so th this is this is a real serious crisis. And while we hold on to our faith and our joy, um, we continue to fight and we've named so many practical ways um, in which um, we can we can do that and, and continue. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank um, uh, Dr. Uh, Cooper and, and Pastor Cooper. It's great to see you all. Um, it's been you know quite some time, but I'm inspired by your um, long distance um, running as a couple and um, as leaders. And so thank you for uh, offering me the space to participate on this panel. Um, and and Dr. Beulah, it's it's great to meet you because so many times we don't know each other. And if we hear about each other, we don't know each other. We don't have the time to talk, to share, to um, to just, you know, um, open up. And, and I, I appreciate when my uh, dear brother, McShepard, um, and I agree with you, um, Dr. Coopy must have been in my head because I was thinking, you know, whether he was going to run for mayor, um, you know, because he's certainly a brilliant brother who has um, done a lot for the city and, and just what he's shared. And uh, Tom, I've talked to him about uh, the incredible work that he and colleagues have done with uh, the policy bridge. Um, you know, I'm, I'm heartened. And, um, and, and Sister Brown, in terms of, you know, organizing this and, and Dr. Towns and, and Dr. Smallwood, just providing the space because we don't oftentimes get the space and, and be able to be how we need to be in that space. Um, and so just the last thing I'll say is, um, I think that we, we have to remember as, as a group, but also as a country, um, this is one big family reunion, really. And we're coming to, uh, maybe it's Medea that's that's you know at the, the 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 orchestration of it, but how how we handle that is how we 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 need to keep moving forward here. And so every member of the family is welcome as and has a place and has a rightful place. And I don't think we should treat anyone um, differently or as disposable. And and if we say we we go we are a, a great country, we have to be about that in everything we say and do, even with all of our mistakes, faults, imperfections, um, and, and the latter. But I, I think that all, so many people are working and have been working in the trenches for so long, have sacrificed and given their lives uh, for making things just a little bit better. And I think recognizing that, acknowledging that, honoring that in ourselves and each other, uh, that's what I take away as well as the brilliance and, and the beauty that each all of you demonstrate and shared in this panel and in your everyday walk. So thank you. Man, thank you, thank you, um, thank you all the all the, uh, the panelists. Um, so grateful for your time, uh, grateful for your insight and your wisdom. Um, thank you for sharing with us today. And most of all, thank you for your commitment to to justice because um, you, you're on this panel um, not because you can talk, but because of what you've already been doing. And uh, we just encourage you to continue to do what you're doing. And we thank, we're so thankful for you, and thankful for. Um, the opportunity to share this afternoon with you. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Uhlenberg, I believe you are going to call us out and tell us about tomorrow. Thank you so much, Reverend Cooper and this outstanding panel. You all have just been fantastic as you engage the issues as well as one another. And we need so much more of this because as you have expressed and ex Blame the many, many things that we are going through. As I think about your conversation this afternoon, you talked about wealth gap and poverty and 
policy bridge and doesn't matter who we elect voting. What are the demands? Our, our spirituality, our ancestors, leadership. It can be lonely as well as dangerous. Systems, education, inequities based on zip code, religious systems, and a whole host of other things. Thank you so much on behalf of Reverend Dr. Teresa Smallwood, who I know would have loved to have been with us today. We say thank you but she will certainly be back tomorrow. Let me just update everyone, our visiting and listening audience. We will be back tomorrow for a talk back beginning at 10 a.m. Central time. That of course, 11 a.m. Eastern time. And that will go for two hours. And that's an opportunity for everyone to be engaged and continue the dialogue that we have had both this morning and this afternoon which will encompass race, gender, politics, and um, economics. So looking forward to seeing as many of you tomorrow for a little while as possible. Please remember the Hugh People, our concert musical uh, selection will open us tomorrow morning. But I just wanted to say once again, on behalf of Vanderbilt Divinity School with Reverend Dr. Emily Towns and the Reverend Teresa Smallwood, with Public Theology and Racial Justice Collaborative. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. Come back, see you tomorrow. Continue to bless us with your work and continue to engage one another on the Ohio ground. God bless you and have a great afternoon, evening, as well as weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>